and please initiate voter registration drive. This is where I think what Rose is doing is is, is great. And and mind you, this is basically uh, Unimas, a few of us, Andrew just now, and a few of, of, of us did uh, a very extensive study in the last 2013 elections. We did a um, uh, national survey with Medeka Center, and we had researchers on the ground throughout the campaign period in, in 25 selected seats, marginal seats. Um, and, and through our observation, this is from Pulau Pinang up to Tawau in, in Sabah. Uh, and, and based on our observation, um, candidates, especially the opposition candidates, who relocate resources for this voter registration drive, and not only register new new voters, but whole programs with them, engage with them, because that we call party identification. That you have a certain sense of attachment or identification with a certain political parties. You might not be necessarily a member, but you just have a certain inclination to vote certain party. This is what we call party identification. So, for example, um, no, I'm not a member of any political party, but I just share the same vision, mission, and principles of that of PKR, for example. So I tend to vote for this party. So some voters have a very strong party identification. Voters with strong party identification is very difficult to change their vote preference, and usually the older voters. So theoretically, if you want to change votes, go for the younger voters. Because they are either weak party identifiers or they are non-partisans as well. They don't have any inclinations to political parties. So this is basically where the battleground is. So you need to capture as many young voters as possible and throw your seats on them and work on them. This is where the concept of registering new voters comes in. So basically you can you not know, capture these young voters compared to the older voters. Run voter education programs and at the end you need to start a movement of change. That resonates throughout the state. You can't be doing something exclusive in Serian, for example, and nobody knows what you're doing. It's good. But it's pockets of movement that doesn't create the earthquake that bring about political tsunami. What happened in 2008 was Bersih with a few groups of NGO Hindraf as well created this Momentum. earthquake that made such a significant ripple that created political tsunami. The problem is it stopped, it didn't go beyond and it didn't reach the shore of Sarawak and also Sabah. Lah. Because we didn't create that earthquake. There's no such movement that could actually shake the very foundations of our Nation of the Sabah and Sarawak. That's what the Sarawak and Sabah NGOs need to do. You can't do isolated work. You need to come together and form a network. And also not only form a network with your friends in Sarawak, but also your friends in Selanjung as well, and also in Sabah. In the case of Safe Rivers, they build network with international NGOs as well. And that would basically help to bring about electoral change. Now let me conclude. Everybody are quoting you somebody tonight, so I don't want to kalah as well. So, so let me end my presentation tonight with this quote by a very famous English philosopher, 19th century English philosopher, Bertrand Russell. He said, no, basically the countries are being ruled by fools and fanatics. Do you agree with me? The countries are being ruled by fools and fanatics. And the problem is the fools and fanatics are very sure of themselves. <laughs> but not the wise men like you and me. <laughs> we have so much of doubt. We want to change. <sighs> so sad. Is it even possible? Very difficult. Sarawak. Very big. 
I sound very pessimistic just now. I, you know, I, I try to, and then later on I finish by being very optimistic. <laughs> it's huge. I mean, let's let's be realistic. It's not easy to change Sarawak because you just need a lot of resources. But what we political scientists let me let me tell you a little story. When when two zero eight, oh. We political scientists, especially me, we, uh, we study elections very much. Uh, I, I love elections, so I study voting behavior quite extensively. Um, and when 2008, when people ask question, uh, UG, which UG was not there, I, I don't know UG from the start back then, but if they say people like UG ask me, hey Faisal, 2008, what's your take of the election? Would the opposition be able to win? I know, and because we have a very uh, extensive knowledge of Malaysian politics and also the elections in Malaysia. We said, ah, impossible. The election can easily be weak. You have vote buying, you have politics of development, so on and so forth, media being controlled. How would the opposition be able to change government or even to win elections and even to deny to third majority? But we were proven wrong. I was proven wrong. Because I underestimated the power of people. Despite whatever the system is that the government used to exploit, to ensure that they could maintain their rule. But when people said enough is enough, nothing can change it. Nothing can hold it. Nothing can stop it. But that happened only in the peninsula, lah, Sengaju, not in Sabah and Sarawak. So you need to make a stand now. Are you following the rest of the majority voters in the peninsula? Or do you want to remain idle under the rule of our beloved Barisan National Sarawak? So the choice is yours. I would end with that too. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go right into the Q&A session now. We'll allow about 10 to 15 minutes. I think that will be long enough for the two presenters, Thomas and Faisal. Eh? Uh, again, I think I didn't follow my own rule just now, so I will repeat again. <laughs> Take two questions and then forward it to them. Yeah, Two questions at one time. Uh, first question. Yep, the lady in pink. Oh, you, you, you want to know why there is no strong Malay leaders? Yeah. I think again, there is this whole explanation on, on uh, political patronage, uh, fear factor. Um, I think not, not only Malay leaders are, for the opposition to basically get good candidates to run in elections is very difficult. Um, in, in, in DAP, they faced the same problem in the last 10 years, before that, before, before this. But in the last 10 years, they were able to recruit young professionals, lawyers, to become candidates. And that is very refreshing. Uh, opposition still fail to do this because basically there is this element of fear mostly among the, the Malays. So not many people basically want to join the opposition parties and sacrifice whatever patronage that they had been receiving from the state, you know, um, all this while. So to, to break that mentality of fear, and that is still real in the case of Sarawak. And that, that is a big stumbling block to me. Any potential for student? <laughs> <laughs> student. Um, I think we have a few, um, and instead of joining PKR, they are joining the AP as well. Some of, some of the Malay uh, uh, students uh, from, from Unimas as well. I think the problem is, uh, DAP is more appealing as compared to PKR. 
And I think the problem is PKR does not have any programs that reach out to the young people as well. So that, that's that's another problem. So even even among the young Malay graduates from Unimas, for example, from public universities, uh, I think a few of them are slowly warming up to DB as far as Sarawak is concerned. Uh, the one from Peninsula, I think most of them would basically join PAS and also on so, so forth. Uh, some would join AMNO, uh, but not many in the case of Sarawak. Young Malay graduates are warming up to the opposition parties. And I think basically you need someone who are willing enough and bold enough and brave enough to lead that movement, to break the sense of fear. Then do you think to that extent, would it be better to have a Sarawak best political party rather than PKR or PAS or the Sorry, uh, what's the question again? Would it be best to? Better, not more best, better to have a Sarawak best political party. Okay. Base. So where is that Sarawak base going to come from? I mean, it's going to come from the people themselves, right? Sarawakians themselves, forming the party or whatever, yeah? Okay, is it better? Anyone want to ask? I think as long as you can, um, I mean, let, let, let's look at the history of political parties in Sarawak. Um, among the opposition parties, the one that are Sarawak based can't even last two elections. Uh, we had Permas, uh, Star, BDS. None of the Sarawak based opposition parties lasted more than two elections. DAP had been in Sarawak since 1978. And, and, and the number of seats that they had accumulated and the kind of results that they managed to achieve in 2011 2013 was not overnight. They made such a lot of effort from 1978. They won one seat. Sometimes they didn't win any seats, no so on and so forth. So in terms of sustainability, in terms of persistence, somehow the national-based opposition parties lasted longer than the Sarawak base. So you know, to me, as long as you can provide that sustainability in terms of checking the power of the government, whether it's Rawat based or national based, I know if it's the choice of the people, then all this. Yeah, um, I mean, as to why uh, the uh, Malay voters in Sarawak, uh, there is very few who uh, Malay leaders who actually come out and lead, and why. Um, Malay voters still basically uh, stick with the PBB all this time. I think part of the factor is probably due to the fact that over here, um, really in terms of numbers, uh, Malays are the minority. And yet, through PBB, they are able to basically rule over the state. And I think one of the that tactics of BN politicians over the year that they have been very successful is to prey on the insecurities, uh, the sense of insecurities of Malay voters here. And strangely, down here in, in a way is minority, but in Peninsula, Malay voters are by far the majority uh, in every sense of the word, not just in terms of uh, the demographic but the control over uh, civil service, military, police, everything you name it is like 90 over percent, you know. And yet there is that sense of we are under threat, you know. And BN politics have always been successful in, in exploiting their insecurities. Now, I don't have an answer, but I think if we can start addressing and understanding you know what is causing the insecurities here and then change the discourse of politics away from 
racial politics, uh, very parochial politics, you know, uh, into uh, the issues uh, of uh, based on issues and uh, ideologies, you know, then maybe we can begin to introduce a different narrative, as you say, into the politics. Because if we keep on thinking in terms of race, 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 you know, the I mean that's what that's the weapon they are using right now in peninsula to divide and rule. They're talking about a minority government, you know, after the last GE that is gonna be that that that, that minority is gonna even string smaller they will even use more issue basically to stay in power. So I think we have to really find a way to change that narrative away from racial politics if we want to see real change. Uh, not just here but also in Peninsula. You know, so any political party that um, uh, don't just champion the right of their community, I think deserve our support no matter how uh, disorganized right now. But you can be that part of the solution to, to organize and to make things better. Yeah. Just to continue from what Thomas is saying, sorry if you don't mind me, me making a comment, uh, two comments. Uh, the first one is uh, what, uh, you know, you could actually volunteer to any of the political parties of your choice uh, in the next coming elections. Uh, even starting now, before the elections arrive, you know, volunteers, interns, those of you with more interest in, in party politics can be can enroll yourself as interns. If not, then just become a volunteer. There are many things to do. Huh? Uh, secondly, I just want to draw attention to the what I read online uh, when Thomas was talking about uh, steering the discourse away into real issues. So in Sinawa, what, what are the real issues? Water, roads, infrastructure, all this, isn't it? Yeah, if you, I mean, I'm not sure how many of you have gone into the rural areas, but uh, the, the, what do you call it? The, the very interesting story, I think I want all of you 